tons of GPU news to talk about today. Let's start with this Ratchet and Clank's PC version will be launching today and it won't have ray tracing support at launch for AMD GPUs. There's some other interesting stuff going on with this game. Uh, this is according to the developers themselves. They say ray tracing on AMD GPUs is disabled at launch. We're working closely with AMD to enable support as soon as possible. And AMD did just launch a new graphics driver today, which does mention a known issue of uh, application crash or driver timeout may be observed while playing Ratchet and Clank uh, with ray tracing and dynamic resolution scaling enabled on some AMD products such as the 7900 XDX and AMD is working with the game developers to resolve some stability issues with ray tracing enabled. Uh, so anyway, it looks like the game itself should be fine and a lot of people would turn off ray tracing anyway to improve performance, probably especially AMD users. So uh, anyway, it looks like that will be uh, something going on. However, the other reason why this game is so interesting interesting is because it supports uh, direct storage 1.2 with GPU decompression as well as NVIDIA's RTX IO which is a, a similar NVIDIA branded technology. Now if you want more info on this I'm sure there will be a bunch of tests coming out. Um, however, uh, um, uh, Digital Foundry, and then also published in a, in a text version at Eurogamer, uh, already looked at the first game with NVIDIA's RTX IO, which again is a very similar uh, technology. This was built in the Portal Prelude RTX. Uh, ha does a little bit of talk about how uh, load times can be decreased significantly. Uh, all of that, when you look at the same kind of system with, with RTX IO off versus on, load, loading into the games. However, this isn't really a game built with the tech in mind. Ratchet and Clank is, so it should be a, a fun place for testing. However, myself, I've got a bunch of stuff going on with family the next few days. Um, so I am going to take a little break from heavy duty testing and videos on that. Uh, so just a qu quick mention, there probably won't be a video from me on that topic, but I would imagine that it's going to be a big topic, direct storage 1.2 being, uh, you know, GPU decompression first game with that. Uh, we should be seeing a lot going on there. Also in that AMD driver, it looks like AMD finally rolls out a Ryzen 7040 Phoenix iGPU drivers. We've had PCs, I've even tested some little mini PCs uh, out with them on the channel. However, they didn't have a specific driver uh, for them at launch. That is, a lot of people have been waiting for that, and it does uh, look like we finally have that, so that is nice. Now, um, in other AMD news, so the weird Radeon 7900 Golden Rabbit Edition that has been rumored, we now see the actual box. So this does... I mean, look real, AMD Radeon RX 7900 GRE. The other interesting thing to note on it is it says 16 gigabytes. Now this is being reported by videocards.com, but the original uh, info came in a tweet by Momomomo US. Um, the information uh, nicely summarized here in this table is that the 7900 GRE will have 84 compute units, so the same as the 7900 XT, uh, so giving it the same amount of stream processors, the same boost clock. The only real difference here is that it's a 16 gigabytes of memory instead of 20, which means the memory bus has to be cut down from 320 to 256, and it also has the same memory speed of 20 gigabits per second, leading to a total of a memory bandwidth of 640 gigabytes per second, which is reduced from 800 on the 7900 XT. Also looks like, uh, you know, uh, runs at a little bit lower power, 300 watts versus 315. Um, anyway, it looks like the re release date on this is July 28th, but again, this has not really been officially announced by AMD at this point, but again, that looks like a pretty legit uh, box and all that, so uh, this does seem to be incoming. However, uh, being called the uh, Golden Rabbit Edition based on the, you know, the Chinese calendar, this certainly sounds like this would likely be a Chinese exclusive card, uh, Chinese market exclusive, so... Uh, we'll have to see what happens with that, what is its price, if we get something like it uh, worldwide at any point, or again, even if this does actually end up being real, uh, based on this not being officially confirmed yet at this point. Also, while I don't cover a whole lot of console news, uh, there has been a bunch of rumors out now about a PlayStation 5 Pro console, and since that would feature AMD graphics, uh, we uh, this could be interesting to talk about. The rumored date would be November of 2024, not this year, November. Um, and the uh, overall rumored uh, specs are fairly interesting. Uh, so I think I'll just hop, hop down to 
that. The idea is that this would be a GPU with uh, 30 workgroup processors, which would be equivalent to 60 compute units, with a memory speed of 18 gigabits per second. Why does that matter? Well, the uh, PlayStation 5 currently has only 18 workgroup processors and 36 compute units, so that is a fairly major upgrade in terms of specs. And also it would be going up from 14 gigabit per second memory to 18 gigabit per uh, second memory, again, if any of this actually ends up being true. Um, and then also we would need to see about pricing, all of that. So it'll be interesting to see um, what, if anything, comes of that. But you can certainly see that, um, you know, the latest games, like I just did a video yesterday as of the time of filming this, uh, showing Remnant 2 on PC, requiring a ton of upscaling, being very hard to run at higher resolutions on PC, even on high-end PCs. Well, um, the game has also been tested out on consoles like the PS5, Xbox Series X, and it also requires a massive amount of upscaling and still doesn't get a stable 60 FPS, even upscaling from 720p, uh, things like that. So the, the consoles themselves, I think, could certainly do with uh, some more power. Um, I think this information is based on the Digital Foundry video, and WCCF Tech is kind of summarizing some of that. So. Anyway, could certainly use uh, with some more power on consoles. Now let's move into some actual GPU side of things. So remember these, uh, I, I reported back <laughs> uh, during Computex about Asus showing off graphics cards where they would get their power through a little pin on the motherboard uh, instead of through power cables actually coming through the actual GPU. Well, it's looking like these are getting closer and closer to actually hitting the market. Um, uh, as reported here at PC World. Now, I have mixed feelings about this. I think in and of itself, uh, this kind of an idea isn't bad. What I don't like is if this is just locked down to one particular motherboard, uh, well, motherboard manufacturer, if this is only certain Asus motherboards that support this, I think that's a problem, especially if it, like, okay, let me put it this way. I don't mind if that's there, if you then also had the normal power connector available to use, because what if you wanna resell this thing? GPUs are expensive and a lot of people resell them. Uh, and so if this is only compatible with certain motherboards, are you just shooting yourself in the foot and ever being able to resell this or give it to somebody else uh, who doesn't have a very specific motherboard? So I don't like that, although the overall idea of this I do like, uh, you know, innovation in hiding the connectors, uh, connecting to the motherboard itself could be fine as long as it works well, but I don't like that if it's too locked down um, and doesn't also let you connect normally or, you know, um, if there was some kind of standard between a bunch of motherboard vendors or something like that, but in general, I'm not a huge fan of that. Anyway, let's talk CPUs for a minute. So AMD's Ryzen 5 7500F that I reported on rumors of recently is actually real. And while this headline at Tech Power Up says available globally, we need to talk a little bit more about what that actually means. Uh, but it did get benchmarked and overall, it's offering very similar performance to the Ryzen 5 7600. It looks like it's between two to 3% slower than the Ryzen 5 7600 and coming in at $180. So significantly less money for about the same performance in gaming, which is very, very interesting. Uh, it looks like only, um, only Asian outlets were seeded with review samples. And it says it's unknown when the CPU will be available outside of Asia at this point in time, despite the headline here saying available globally. I did find some follow-up on this idea from AMD over in an article from Hardware Lux that I've machine learning translated, um, uh, where the statement from AMD says this processor model will be available starting July 23rd, 2023 at 9 p.m. Eastern time. It will be available in greater China as a processor in box and in the rest of the world as an option for select system builders. So basically, if you want to actually just buy the CPU, uh, the only plan is for a launch in China right now. The problem is that um, the rest of the world will get them, but it looks like just uh, won't be for sale individually. Now, sometimes I think sometimes system integrators do end up like 
selling some into various you know channels, uh, and, and maybe you could get your hands on them that way. Uh, but that seems to be the fate of that. I, I really wish that was available. Um, you know, you know, just sold in box. I think if it wasn't coming in noticeably cheaper than the seventy six hundred uh, for about the same gaming performance, it could be a very attractive product. Now, speaking of other AMD CPU leaks, we're seeing TechSpot reporting a leak of a Ryzen 9 7945 HX 3D, which would be bringing a 3D vCache part to gaming laptops. The HX line, I think this is their Dragon range, which is basically going in the high, uh, you know, high power like desktop replacement. They're basically desktop parts shoved into a laptop, I think. Um, but this does look pretty legit. Uh, we're seeing uh, tweets showing product listings that actually do specifically list this part. For example, an Asus ROG Strix Scar 17-inch gaming laptop listed with the CPU as a Ryzen 9 7945HX 3D. Anyway, I think this is very interesting, bringing the 3D vCache into a laptop form factor for gaming performance. Also, the 3D vCache chips are very, very energy efficient for the gaming performance that they have on offer. Uh, if you look at something like the 7800X 3D up against like the i9-13900K in gaming or something like that, right? Um, so I think, I think a, a laptop form factor for that certainly sounds interesting for me. Now in other CPU news, this one's uh, not happy news. It looks like Intel is reportedly, again this is not official from Intel yet, uh, but there are reports saying that Intel is planning a price hike across all core CPUs as part of a restructuring policy. This is reported by WCCF Tech. Apparently they're saying the original news comes from German outlet PC Games Hardware, where the forum's moderator disclosed the information, but the source contacted two German suppliers who verified a letter from Intel mentioning the price hike. Um, so anyway, that kind of sucks. <laughs> uh, in other Intel CPU news, um, it, it, we're getting more information about Intel's 14th gen core non-K parts this time. So this is the rumored Raptor Lake refresh, which has so many rumors now at this point pointing to an October launch. Um, now we're getting more specs. These are the non-K parts now. Now this is coming from Chilled Dog on Twitter, which has a, a good uh, leak track record, so I would put some, some stake in this, although again, it's not official information. Uh, one of the biggest things I'm noticing here is there were some earlier leaks and rumors pointing to the i3 chip getting bumped up to six cores, which would have been amazing, but this leak, and again, I do put a good amount of credit in Chilled Dog leaks, uh, saying four core, eight thread on that part. Lots of the other parts are getting additional cores, both in the performance and uh, efficiency, you know, various chips. I've talked more about this in other videos. There's the, the table of the summarized 14th gen uh, leaks rumors versus the current 13th gen. Again, this is the non-K parts here um, on that. Uh, now, also, again, the uh, there is more confirmation that we should be seeing the 14th gen core chips launching in October. This confirmation is coming from a Chinese PC maker, uh, me Mechanic? Me Mechanic? M Mechanic? Uh, and it, probably Mechanic or something like that is how you're supposed to say that. But anyway, it looks like they were showing off some... Uh, uh, some computers which will probably be having these 14th gen parts and talking about October release dates for all of that. So uh, seems to be a lot more evidence that that does uh, indeed seem to be the case. Now let's jump into a little bit of memory. So AMD DDR5 goes over 9,000. Uh, in my last news video, I reported that AMD, um, some AMD motherboards AM, on the AM5 platform have got a new BIOS update. Uh, others are still waiting for it, but this allows the memory to go well above where it was initially at launch. And it looks like overclockers have already gone over 9,000 uh, on the DDR5 speeds there. I think the exact number is 9058. Now again, this is some um, early overclocking results. It'll be interesting to, uh, to see how far people are able to push this stuff. It's nice to have that ability to play around with it. 
Uh, in other news, so more uh, review outlets are getting their hands on 4060 Ti 16 gigabyte cards and getting uh, some different results depending on which games they are testing. Now, I finally was able to find one in stock in the US. I don't think there's a lot of supply of these. I don't think it's that the demand is huge. I think there's not a lot of supply. Uh, and I do have one ordered, although I don't have it with me yet. I'm waiting on shipping for that. So I will eventually do some of my own testing with the 4060 Ti 16 gigabyte, especially interested in how it stacks up against the RX 6800 XT from AMD, which is currently in a similar price class. Um, but depending on the games you test, many of them don't need more than eight gigabytes, especially if, you, if uh, a lot of reviewers use a review set of games that goes back a long time. Uh, and a many older games aren't really gonna see an advantage from that. So over at like Tech Power Up, for example, they're seeing on average the 4060 Ti 16 gigabyte performing the same as the 4060 Ti 8 gigabyte at 1080p. And um, uh, only like 1% ahead on average at 1440p, 2% ahead at uh, 4K. But again, that depends on your, your set of games you're testing because the, it's true that the uh, you know average PC game over the course of all PC games in history, very few of them go over eight gigabytes of VRAM, especially at 1080p. If you test a set of newer games or games that are specifically known to go over eight gigabytes, you get very different results, which is what uh, actually happened over at PC Games Hardware, where they tested it out in 11 games and in every single one saw noticeable improvements by having the 16 gigabytes versus the eight gigabytes. I also love the fact that they show frame time graphs. This is one of the reasons why in my comparison videos, I show the live footage with the frame time graphs because this is the best way to actually see how GPUs are performing differently. Uh, so for example, if you look at the, something like, um, uh, this frame time graph here on Diablo 4, this is 1080p DLAA with frame gener uh, uh, I think with frame generation on. And frame generation can use extra, um, yeah, uh, yes, frame generation on, can use extra VRAM, <laughs> which, which should be noted. <laughs> um, you can see here that in green, you get the 16 gigabyte card giving you this flat line. But then in their uh, orange line, you see the eight gigabyte card getting these uh, regular, uh, these massive spikes on a regular basis, which are huge stutters, annoying to use, that kind of stuff. Anyway, there's a ton of information available, but in general, you often see a lower frame time average. Uh, again, with frame time graphs, lower is better, and you also want smooth. Uh, the, the big spikes like we're seeing right there, that would be a noticeable stutter in gameplay. That one's on Doom Eternal. So again, if you if you test the the a different set of games, you can actually get a rather large different between difference between the two GPUs, which I don't think we should use to conclude that the 16 gigabyte is worth the $500 <laughs> that they're asking for it. Instead, I think we should use it to um, uh, to confirm that the eight gigabyte card is not the one that should have been launched. So if you look at their uh, PC games hardware game set here and, and the differences at 1080p, 1440p, and 4K, you see on average some, some very large differences. Yeah, some games were only 2% at 1080p, but jump up to 29% difference at, uh, at 1440p and 45% difference at 4K. If you look at Spider-Man, Miles Morales, that kind of a thing. Anyway, so the, so the point is here that depending on the game set you look at, I really wanna get my hands on, on one of these to test. Uh, again, I like to look at the latest games, which I think do skew towards using more than eight gigabytes of VRAM uh, more frequently. Um, speaking of the 4060 Ti 16 gigabyte costing too much, it's already apparently gone below MSRP in Germany as reported by videocards.com. Uh, so it'll be, I think this could be a very interesting card if the price came down. This really, if they wanted to charge $400 for a 4060 Ti, it really should have been this version and not bump this one up to $500. But anyway, <laughs> um, as I have mentioned in some other videos though, I do think that the, the, it could make some sense for certain productivity workloads where you have to have an NVIDIA GPU for acceleration and you need 16 gigabytes of VRAM, and this could be a budget entry, um, you know, below the like $1,200 RTX 4080. But I think for gaming workloads, the price to performance just doesn't make sense. Uh, anyway, we're also seeing uh, Intel talking about uh, 
moving to an, an AVX 10, which apparently is taking AVX 512 with more features and supporting it across both P and E cores. I don't want to talk about a lot of this because my channel focuses more on gaming performance, but the uh, latest Intel CPUs haven't supported AVX 512, but it's looking like they're moving to an AVX, uh, I think partially because of the PE core split, something like that. Uh, I, honestly, this is a little outside of my uh, normal comfort zone on expertise, but it looks like they're introducing something called AVX 10, which should increase compatibility of this. And I will have all my sources, including this uh, Pharonix article linked in the video description for those of you who would be uh, interested in following up on some more info on that topic. Um, uh, this is kind of interesting, getting into just some uh, random little uh, cool GPU gadgets. Um, it looking like there's a Pocket A1 A500 NVIDIA GPU available from AdLink. Uh, and the idea is you could then just pop this in uh, th via Thunderbolt into a laptop to give you some increased uh, GPU compute power. Looks like a neat little device, um, but I don't think I need to go into full detail on it. Um, now, uh, in other uh, interesting <laughs> devices, how about running PC games on a Nintendo Switch? So in a recent YouTube video, GeekerOne demonstrated the process of modifying a Nintendo Switch console to play PC games. I guess the first step was unlocking the bootloader and installing Android and then using that to install Ubuntu operating system. And then from there, you can go all uh, go nuts adding in Steam and putting uh, PC games on there, although the performance uh, was uh, not good. <laughs> but it's kind of a neat little project, especially as we see the rise in the little handheld PC devices. Anyway, um, uh, now let's get into some... Uh, some uh, GPU cooler news. So there is a uh, ROG Strix RTX 4090 EVA 02 edition. Uh, so this is part of the uh, Evangelion, Evangelion uh, line of products from Asus, which I, I know there is definitely a market for this type of uh, design. If we want a closer look at the GPU there, we get that. But anyway, um, Interesting design that I'm sure some people will be uh, will be on the lookout for. Also, we're seeing Asus preparing RTX 4070 Ti ROG Strix ROGI Edition graphics card. Apparently, this is something that they have done before. Um, again, I don't think this is targeted at the U.S. market, but is an interesting design. Um, and then uh, we're also seeing in I, I think this is the Chinese market the GPU. Uh, uh, cooler maker ASL launching the RTX 4060 Youth Edition, uh, which certainly has a different design than I have seen on other GPUs in the past. So that is interesting. Again, I don't think this is targeting the US market though. Uh, we're seeing the, an MSI ARC A310 low profile GPU, apparently uh, spotted in the wild. It says it appears that MSI low end ARC series are not limited just to Chinese OEMs. Uh, so that could be interesting for people looking for, like, you know, I don't think the gaming on uh, performance on the A310s are anything to write home about. However, they do have an AV1 encoder. Uh, so an AV1 encoder with a low profile design, low power usage, and a uh, low enough price could certainly be interesting to people. And then the last thing I'll mention in today's video is Ubisoft games purchased on Steam will become inaccessible with accounts deactivation. So I have a feeling they're going to get enough pushback against this that we might see this change. Uh, but as of now, um, uh, we're seeing tweets like this where uh, if you close your Ubisoft account, you will not be able to play your purchased games on Steam. Uh, and Ubisoft had been talking about deactivating accounts that, that were uh, no longer active. So... Uh, Ubisoft support saying uh, we're not closing active accounts. However, if you decide to close your Ubisoft account, you will not be able to play your games even if they have been bought on Steam. However, wait a second, they're not cl closing active accounts. So what if you have some old Ubisoft games that you haven't played in forever, um, but you know you don't want to actually just lose ac lose um, lose access to them if you ever did want to go back and play them just because you haven't signed into an Ubisoft game in forever. Anyway, I think we'll get uh, pushback on this. And again, you can take a look in my uh, sources for more information. 
Uh, like I said, I'm going to be pretty busy uh, taking some time to do, do some family stuff for the next couple of days, so don't expect uh, videos uh, the next two days or so. But uh, um, anyway, I'm hoping some other outlets take a good look at the Ratchet & Clank launch uh, today for both performance uh, look, but also I'm really interested in the direct storage uh, 1.2 with GPU decompression, especially looking at, okay, how does this game run on a hard drive? Anyway, I'm sure some other places will take a look at that. Uh, and I'll certainly be uh, <laughs> looking out for that in the meantime. Uh, and I'll get back to you guys in a couple of days. I hope all of you have an excellent day.